And would you begin by telling us what really got you on the journey to discover soul? Yes, well, I think it began when I was about 11. It began with an out-of-body experience, which I had no knowledge of ahead of time. I was taking a rest on my bed after lunch on a very hot day, and suddenly I felt the bed open beneath me, and I was pushed down beneath, and then I found myself in a tunnel, a long tunnel, going through with a rushing, rushing, roaring noise all around me, which was really terrifying. And then suddenly I was spewed out at the other end, like um, a cannonball from a cannon, into this vast darkness of space. And that too was terrifying because I had no idea of anything like that. And I heard a voice speaking and it just said two words. It said, I am. Now whether it was going to say more, I'll never know. But at that point I got so frightened that I found myself back in that roaring, rushing noise and in the tunnel. And then I found myself back in my bed, waking up wondering what on earth had happened to me. And at that time, my mother had channel messages with a friend, and I was, we sat down and a message came to say that I had been a medium in other lives and that this gift would return to me and that I just had to trust my own path. That was all it said. Could you tell us a little bit about how these voices came to be uh, with your mother and her friends? Um, I think it started, it was in about 1943, at the height of the war, and she had two friends. One was a French woman and one an American woman. And I think they just sat down together and one of them found that they could do this automatic writing and they began to receive these messages. And these went on for many years, maybe 20 years. One of the people dropped out and there was just the French woman and, and my mother left. But these messages were so striking that uh, I kept records of them in any case, that they really influenced my life. But wasn't it, I remember reading in your book that you said that it was during the war and they were together when the voices started and that they were very concerned about the violence and destruction that was taking place in the world. Yes, that's what they were talking about when yeah. they started these uh, messages. And they had actually an extraordinary experience. They were in a room together in New York and it was a clear blue sky outside and suddenly there was a clap of thunder and the window blew open outwards which it didn't normally do just both windows together clap of thunder and then they heard a voice in the room and they felt a great presence in the room and it said to them uh, be sure of thy spirit as i am of being the wine and the breath of the one who is foremost and that was an extraordinary terrifying experience of the numinous and after that they began to uh, receive these messages and the messages spoke of something they call the dream of the water they said find the dream of the water and find the stone at the foot of the tree now at that time they had my mother and her friend had no idea what this could possibly mean and of course i didn't as a child because i just had little glimpses of what they were writing but as I grew older, I read these messages and saw that they were focused on a time of great trial for humanity, a time when humanity had to awake or it would destroy itself. And so this was, as I say, way back in the 1940s and early 50s. And I had no idea what the dream of the water meant, but these words stayed with me. What was the stone at the foot of the tree? What was the dream of the water? And out of that, uh, phrase came the title of my present book, The, the Dream of the mm -hmm. Cosmos, mm. because I realized that that is the uh, whole dimension of reality we know nothing about, nothing. which is the ground of our own reality. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of my quest, those two experiences, leaving my body and the encounter with these uh, received um, automatic writing messages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that what was really the, the core of the experience was that the world was so far away from this dream. It was so unconscious of the dream of the water or of the cosmos that we were killing each other. And yes. so that is intensified so much today. And here you are now at this stage of your life still doing the work of the dream of the water and the dream of the cosmos. Yes, it's taken me all these years, all these decades to really become um, 
mature enough to be able to put it out into the world in a form which the world can mm -hmm. understand. Mm -hmm. It takes many years, first of all, of studying and learning and also the work I did in uh, psychology and becoming an analyst. All that was preparation work for what I'm putting out now. Mm -hmm. But I feel that if I'd put it out before, I wouldn't have been mature enough to really no. um, integrate everything that's happened mm -hmm. in my life with what's happening in the world. And I think that's an important point because so often in the world there is a pressure to always know and publish and get something out uh, even when we're very young that in the university that seems to be uh, the goal is to write, to publish, to talk and I think many people feel that they can't function in that way and that because they know that it takes that time, it takes a long time to really integrate time. it, to bring it together. Mm -hmm. And that integration is what has been lost in so much of the work that has been published and that is out there. Mm -hmm. It isn't that seasoned wisdom that has integrated all of the experiences of mm -hmm. one's life. And that brings me to uh, asking you a little bit about your life. I mean, you were in uh, the United States at the time that uh, those yes. messages actually began. That's right, yes. And what happened after that? Well, after that, we returned as a family to England, and I went to university. I went to Oxford University, and I studied medieval history, because that was what interested me, and also the Renaissance. And those early messages had told us, they said, study the history of early Christianity, early Christianity. Uh, study the Reformation, and I did that later on, but not at the time when I was studying in Oxford. I wanted to lay the ground of medieval history. So that's what I did then, and then um, by a series of coincidences after I left university, two or three years later, I found myself, I wanted to explore the world, as many young people do, and I found myself in Rome, and I met somebody who was planning an encyclopedia of art. And by a series of amazing, fortuitous um, coincidences, they said, would you like to travel to the Far East and gather photographs of all the works of art in the museums there, right the way through from India to uh, Japan? China at that uh, period was absolutely a no-go area, so that didn't come into it. And of course, I leapt to the chance and said, yes, it would be fantastic. <laughs> and so off I went on my journey. It started in India. And in India, I encountered both Hinduism and Buddhism and became very interested in that as I explored the art of these, uh, this great culture. And uh, then I went further east into um, Cambodia, Laos, um, Indonesia, always going to the museums and asking the curators for help with choosing the pictures which they thought most suitable for inclusion in an encyclopedia, and learning about the art as I went, which was really an education in mm -hmm. itself. But at the same time, I learned about the religion, um, you know, how, how Hinduism had spread right the way through Southeast Asia, how deeply um, embedded it was, for instance, in Cambodia, and how beautiful these sculptures were to express this uh, different religion, which, of course, in Christianity, I hadn't encountered anything to do with Hinduism and Buddhism in my mm -hmm. education. What was it in Hinduism and Buddhism that was omitted in Christianity? Um, I think that's almost too big a question to, to cover. But in I mean, this. in your in your tr in in my in trip, there was the idea first of all two two main ideas: the idea of reincarnation that was very very uh, strong in the both Hindu and the Buddhist culture, and also the idea that there was a state of ignorance to be overcome, that humanity was living in a state of, of ignorance, not of sin, which is the Christian emphasis, mm -hmm. but of ignorance, and that this state could be overcome by deepening one's consciousness, deepening the um, communion between one's surface uh, personality or one's surface consciousness and the deep ground of reality. Mm -hmm. And of course they call that um, enlightenment, and I hadn't come across that term before. Mm. And that fascinated me, and I began to, when I returned from this great journey, in fact I made two journeys, but when I returned, I began to study uh, Hinduism and Buddhism in more detail and mm -hmm. to read the great text and mm -hmm. the commentaries on the text. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that that was a huge difference to think of the destruction in the world and the violence in the world not as sin but as ignorance and how deeply then the world needed to awaken to something that would allow it to connect with that ground of being 
or that light of consciousness and love. Absolutely, yes. This is really what I think with the ground was laid there for what I understood later, which is exactly what you've just been saying. But it gave me the sense that humanity had a goal to reach, which was a spiritual goal, and that it wasn't enough to just go on as we were in the same old patterns, that this was all a product of ignorance, the mm -hmm. way we were living now, and that the earth was sacred. I really came across there the idea that the earth was sacred and that everything was sacred, the whole of life. Of course, that is the Buddhist teaching, Yes, and m even more than the Hindu. And I think this is what the Buddha brought, was compassion for all living creatures. Mm -hmm. And that was missing in my Christian upbringing, certainly. And so this was like a revelation to me. And it obviously deepened over the years and I, as I studied more. But that's a powerful revelation to to think of the earth and every living thing in the earth as divine, as divine and sacred. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly something that's been omitted in Christianity, as we yes. have a very different attitude toward nature as, as really almost sinful. And it's something matter itself has nothing of the divine within it. This is what came through, certainly from my um, childhood experience of Christianity. I was absolutely oppressed by the sense of sin and guilt that was given to young children uh, as they went to church. You know, something was wrong, and I, I used to feel sick in church. I absolutely hated going to church. I liked one or two of the hymns, but that was about all. <laughs> and I think it was the sense that was, I felt this is all wrong. Something is missing. And uh, this, then when I went to the Far East and, and India, I found that what was missing was the sense of the sacred, but also the sense of moving towards a different goal, a spiritual mm -hmm. goal, and also the idea of the transformation of consciousness, that it was through that. Mm -hmm. And I encountered, I went to the ashram of uh, Sri Ramana Maharshi down in the uh, south of India, and I stayed there for a while. And of course, his great teaching was ask the question, who am I? Who am I? Who is living my life, my body? Take yourself deeper and deeper and deeper until you reach the ground which is asking that question. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a huge shift from Christianity as well because Christianity's focus is on worship of some other being rather than going inward and becoming that being Absolutely. ourselves. Absolutely. That, that was the huge difference. The, the emphasis on Christianity was entirely on the external um, as you say, the worship belonging to the community of Christians mm -hmm. and believing that because of that you were saved. And I could never accept that. Mm -hmm. I thought this is ridiculous that exactly. we should be I saved. I could never accept that either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I like this Eastern idea that you had to accomplish your own redemption. Yes, that's a huge point. By going within yes. and connecting with the divine within mm -hmm. yourself. And this is what we see that is uh, still existing in Christianity, especially in fundamentalism, is that the emphasis is always on the outer and, uh, and a divine the being, yes, that is not here, but is far away, ex not in to nature. Us, external yes. to external us. External to, to us. Nature. And yeah. that the only way that that external being, that the divine, is actually revealed to us is through one text mm -hmm. only, the Bible, so that everything is external and what comes through us, for instance, is in your vision uh, that you had as a child, and also in the voices, that that would be discounted because absolutely. it isn't coming from the Bible. Yes, absolutely. And also the Bible in the book of Genesis, it, it said, which was perfectly appropriate probably for the time, <laughs> although I don't think it really was, uh, that we were given dominion over the earth mm -hmm. and that we were given dominion over the animals rather than that the animals and the human species were all part of a greater entity, if you like, or, or a greater um, wholeness. So this idea took root in the very literal mind of the people who interpreted Christianity, instead of um, seeing the mistake that might have been made, even perhaps in the translation from the Hebrew into English or Hebrew into Greek and then into English. There may have been um, mistakes made, which I don't know about, which gave the idea that the human species was, was the superior species mm -hmm. and that we were given dominion over mm -hmm. the earth. And yes. that's catastrophic. Oh, it is. And it's led directly to what we're doing now. Exactly. And to really the rape of the earth. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's uh, absolutely terrible. But until Christianity goes back to its roots and really looks at, at these things, nothing is going to change. 
So anyway, I find that deeply upsetting, not really knowing the reason why as a, as a young woman growing up in this culture, but feeling something was wrong. And then the revelation of the Eastern traditions and the emphasis on going within and uh, changing or transforming one's own consciousness and with it one's being and therefore one's attitude to the world and developing compassion for all life. This was something that was deeply imprinted mm -hmm. on me at that mm -hmm. time. And then I think because of that, I was drawn into uh, towards Jung and Jungian analysis because I read Modern Man in Search of a Soul when actually I'd had a miscarriage, or rather my, my husband read it to me when I was recovering. And there again I thought, oh, this is something in the West that I can hold on to. This is something that could lead me to a great understanding of myself, but in Western terms. So I, uh, in fact, because of a uh, deep depression which I'd had for very many years, I embarked on a Jungian analysis in order to understand where the depression was coming from and to help myself. Well, is this, when you came back from the East then and you had time to contemplate these differences between the tradition that you had been brought up in, in your culture, and the tradition that you had come in contact with in the East, it was during those years that you had uh, discovered Jung? Yes, it was, I think, just beginning to discover Jung. In the meantime, I'd got married when I came back from the Far East, and I, was tr I wrote a book called The One Work, A Journey Towards the Self, in which I put everything that I'd learned, and I tried to connect it with the mystical aspect of Christianity, mm -hmm. which I already knew about mm -hmm. and had studied partially when I'd been at Oxford. So I tried to put this mystical tradition of Christianity together with the Eastern traditions, and to understand that Christianity, in essence, was saying the same thing, yes. but the actual Christian teaching of the Church had missed the point. It had misinterpreted Christ's teaching mm -hmm. of um, the way to the Father. They'd taken it literally. And the way to the Father was really going inward to this deep ground mm -hmm. of being. So I put that into my book, and then um, I married. But I needed to understand where my depressions were coming from for, at that point. When I was about 28, I entered uh, Jungian analysis. Mm -hmm. And I worked quite a few years with a, a man. And then later, um, when I w wished to train as an analyst myself, I went to study with Gerhard Adler and his wife, Hella, who actually had worked, both of them, with Jung and Jung's mm -hmm. wife. So that was my um, sort of gradual introduction to Jungian psychology and to the thinking of Jung about the soul. About the soul. Mm. Did, in that analysis, did you discover the roots of this depression as having a relationship to what had been omitted in your culture? Yes, I think I absolutely did. It was uh, much deeper than a personal depression. It was really a depression of the whole feminine principle in our culture mm. and uh, of the soul, of the deepest human feelings and needs uh, that religion really didn't hold, it, uh, the, these needs and feelings and longings went beyond what religion was able to offer for many people, not for all people, obviously, but certainly for myself and a great many other people. Mm -hmm. And well, Jung, to me, brought the soul to life. He, he, he brought back the reality of this deep layer of the psyche back into the culture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't you think that with some people that must, who don't long for it, that it must be on such a deep, unconscious level that that they're not aware that there is this other dimension to long for. I mean, it, it hasn't really come up enough in consciousness for them to Th long that's for. That's true, and I think it's responsible for a lot of depression in society, mm -hmm. particularly the depression of women, but also the depression of children who are brought up, uh, who come into life with all the spontaneity and joy mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. children everywhere, and then um, have nothing to hang on to. There's no. there's no sort of path or route or anything. There is fundamentalist Christianity, but it doesn't nourish the soul. It, it uh, gives you a path to follow, but it misses out so much. And so much of the energy that would go into a discovering soul is projected outward to save someone else's soul. That uh, in the fundamentalist tradition, it's so important that you were always talking to others about saving their souls. Yes. And I mean, it's uh, certainly in the States, that's very, dominant in fundamentalism. Yes, well, I, I remember, um, I think that Maharshi said in India, he said, the greatest service you can render the world is your own um, 
self-realization or your own mm -hmm. enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So I always remembered that. So I always was wary of the collective path. I was looking for the individual mm -hmm. path, this path of union with the divine. And that was actually your journey. And that was my journey. And the voices mm -hmm. from uh, from that wonderful experience. But the uh, voice actually finally gave a name uh, for itself, didn't it? Well, while I was, um, th this is going deeper still, but when I was in analysis with Hella Adler, I had a visionary dream which was, which really shaped, this was the second huge experience in my life which changed the course of my life and led me to my writing really. Anyway, the dream was, I think I should tell you the dream because it was so um, numinous, although we didn't really discuss it. Hella very wisely said, we just leave this dream, we don't go into it, time will reveal its meaning to you. And I think that was tremendously wise of her, because there's always a danger of psychic inflation if you identify with a vision, a vision of the type that I had. And she knew that, of course, I didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. But by saying, just wait and things will unfold, mm -hmm. she really taught me about the feminine. Hmm. Rather than going in and um, you know making it into something, I had to just wait until its meaning was revealed. That is so And it beautiful. was so wise yeah. and so feminine. So she taught me the meaning of the feminine. There's also the danger when you try to put it into words that even if the words seem to be accurate in some rational way, that we feel reduced. The experience is somehow reduced. Yes, it's reduced. Well, I'll just tell you the dream because yeah. it was extraordinary. It was that I was... Um, it was the time, it was May, when the corn is just green. And I dreamt that I was in rather a kind of rocky place, really. And I came round the s side of a great boulder, rather like the megaliths, a huge boulder, this great stone. And I came round into this great vast expanse of green. And I found myself skimming over the wheat, um, mile after mile, just skimming over it. And then I found myself going down into a valley, and I didn't know whether to go on or not, but I didn't seem to stop. And I suddenly was stopped by a huge net that was stretched right across this valley. I found myself entangled in it and lying on my back. And it was held by two men, one at each side, on each side of the valley, quite sort of an expanse of about five miles across, something like that. And as I lay there on my back, looking up at the, at the sky, I saw this vision of a cosmic woman. And she was naked, and she was beautiful, but she was not young like the figures of Aphrodite or the Botticelli painting in Florence. She was a mature woman, not old, but maybe in about 40 years sort of age. And she had a great wheel in her abdomen. and. Uh, this was obviously a cosmic dimension of the wheel. It was a, a vision of the cosmos itself. I look, looking back, I now know. And I had a wheel also in my abdomen. And she pointed to her abdomen and signaled that I was to move. Uh, it, mine was a little bit to the left, and she told me that I was to move mine to the center. I was to center my wheel as hers was centered. And that was her message. She said, didn't say anything but she just indicated that, um, in Jungian terms, I was to become more conscious of this deep center in myself and the relationship between that center and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So that was my vision. I never came again. I didn't hear any words. But the message gradually unfolded, and it was that vision, really, that led me to write the book, The Myth of the Goddess. Mm -hmm. But there must have been, I mean, what is so difficult to put into words is the feeling the numinous quality of the dream must have been so powerful. It was immensely powerful, and Jung said that it's the encounter with the numinous that heals the soul. Mm -hmm. And certainly that didn't heal my soul immediately because it took many years to integrate, but part of the integration was the discovery of all that it was to lead to. Mm -hmm. And that uh, gradually cured my depression because I was really obviously sitting on something or holding something or repressing something that needed to be 
made more conscious. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important point, that when Jung says that the numinous will heal us, that sometimes in the West we think that if we just have the vision, that we will be healed in the Gnostic sense of mm -hmm. you have the experience and you are transformed. I think we are transformed but it in takes a way, time. but it takes time, mm -hmm. and, and we have to integrate it, and that takes time. Yeah, we have to live it. And that takes to, to embody it. It takes mm -hmm. time to embody the vision in our time and space. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, I think, that with all visionary experiences, one needs to remember that. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I have talked with so many people, as I'm sure you have, and especially as a teacher with students and teaching mythology, and when they would tell me their dreams or their experiences. Many students, I was teaching during the 60s and 70s, when students were... Uh, using LSD mm. and many of them had powerful experiences and it, they were overwhelmed by it but they had no knowledge of how to integrate it mm -hmm. no framework whatsoever or even with their dreams they would say I had this dream and I've never told anybody mm. and well, that's where they're that's just left hanging hanging you know. well, there is there's nothing except Jungian psychology which can integrate that kind of experience or that kind of dream mm -hmm. and as you say people are left hanging with these visions, not knowing what to do with them, and in great danger of being inflated by them and thinking that they are the Messiah or mm -hmm. you know, that they've come to save the world or whatever, without having sufficient grounding to be able to find a methodology to bring it through. To bring it through, and there is something that's important, for instance, in the dream that you had of the cosmic feminine dimension of the divine, that we don't want to be inflated, but at the same time we have to realize that on a deep level, we are that. Yes, well, yeah. that also takes time. <laughs> and that also, I <laughs> mean, not inflation, soon. but indeed we are that. We, we are that. <laughs> yes. But yes, I, I remember a, a Sufi saint who said, I am God or I am the divine. He was immediately killed. That, <laughs> that was the fate in those days mm -hmm. of uh, identifying yourself as the divine. Mm -hmm. You just couldn't do it. But I think when but it's coming into consciousness it, now. Yes, it is. It, it is. is because it's a. Uh, to say that in Christianity would be a total disaster. To say that I, that e each of us is the divine yes. would be a sin, a sin against God, against the divine. That's right. I think that in, I was thinking of St. Francis as we were talking, and I was thinking of his visionary dream of uh, Christ on the crucifix, not Christ crucified, but Christ resurrected on the cruci mm -hmm. little crucifix in that um, <laughs> yeah. place near Assisi. Um, and how, how, of how he integrated that dream in the terms of, of his own age, really, and how he was able to do extraordinary things, really, with um, setting about healing his culture and giving a different view of Christianity, going right back to the teaching mm -hmm. of Christ. Mm -hmm. well, but he did it by st stripping off in the marketplace <laughs> and, until he was stark naked mm. and then saying, you know, I'm going a different way. I'm no longer going to be a merchant or sure. whatever I was before. He made a clean break. But Im imagine the courage and, and also the risk of psychosis now that you couldn't really do that without risking psychosis. Yes. So well, I think one has to go a more gentle and, <laughs> and slow way. <laughs> not, not go strip in the marketplace. Not go strip in the marketplace. But um, I suppose you'll talk about it later, but maybe it would be important to say just a few words about uh, Christianity and how for 400 years there was still knowledge of the tradition that Jesus taught the hidden secret path of going inward and finding the luminous ground. Absolutely. But that yeah. was shifted. Well, that was in the, in the Gnostic tradition, but uh, as you say, the first, well, it's actually the first three centuries were all right, and there were many women teaching in the early church, even women bishops. Um, but then in the fourth century, it all began to change. And um, really, there were very, very powerful men who brought about this shift. Um, one was a, a, a const two emperors really. One was Constantine in 325, who ordered the repression of all the Gnostic texts and that they should be burned. But the second one was uh, Theodosius in uh, 380 A.D., who uh, promulgated a decree that anyone who didn't believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were one and the same person would be declared a heretic. Now, heresy hadn't come into the church until this edict of Theodosius, and he ordered the destruction of the pagan temples and anything to do with paganism. So that made a very, be between the two emperors, that made a huge break with the past, and Christianity then became the religion of the empire with Constantine mm -hmm. and his, his own mm -hmm. vision. 
and he thought that his army had been saved by Christ mm -hmm. and was converted to Christianity. And that, to me, was a disaster for the church in one sense. And yet, in another, I think one has to acknowledge the um, continuity of the actual transmission of the sacred through the Catholic Church for many, many centuries. So although I think that they lost the original teaching, a great deal was carried forward. The sense of the numinous was carried forward. The sense of the um, connection with the divine was carried forward, although not so much in the individual sense, more the collective sense. Just that it did exist in the it, universe. Yes, it, and the, the, the huge mistake in Christianity was, I think, came in with St. Augustine with the doctrine of original sin. Mm -hmm. And at that time, reading the texts of early Christianity, I was really um, not only amazed, but shocked to discover how deeply convinced of their own sinfulness and their own sexual sinfulness mm -hmm. the early Christian fathers were, including most particularly St. Augustine. Um, St. Augustine actually had a long relationship of 16 or 17 years with a woman he brought from North Africa. And he had a son by her whom he called Deo Donatus, gift of God, which is a beautiful word for a son. But um, he then abandoned her and decided that he should have no more relationships with women, although he did have one, one other one. But he sent her back to North Africa, which must have broken her heart. And he didn't realize that that was the sin, really, that yes. he was guilty of. And so he had this sense of guilt, and indeed many other, um, as I say, the early Christian fathers had this sense of guilt, and they projected this sense, particularly Augustine, onto the whole body of humanity. And Augustine himself said that uh, sin was passed through the act of sexual union from generation to generation, from person to person, so that Adam's sin was actually passed on through the sexual act. Now that was the most appalling belief, A, and the most appalling teaching. Well, I've always and thought that And I think it yeah. crucified women. Yes. And it crucified the feminine in man. Mm -hmm. And it crucified children who were brought up in this terrible belief that mm -hmm. they were sinful from the from the From birth, the beginning. From the beginning. And that the very from act, conception. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that the very act that brought them into being was sinful. And mm -hmm. in some churches, in some countries, a woman had to be cleansed well, After even childbirth, this country, in this country was too. It also even my sister-in-law used to do it when, when she first married. After she had her children, she used to go to church because she was quite a confirmed Christian, and she used to be cleansed of this. Um, I don't know what you would call it, pollution of childbirth. That is uh, unbelievable. You know, when I heard that for the first time, I really I, I had a difficulty believing it. But a Greek friend of mine said that in the Orthodox Church, uh, church in Greece, that the woman could not enter the church. She had to be cleansed outside yeah. the church was, before she could enter. It was called enter. the churching of women in, in England. The what? The churching of women. Really? Yeah. <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> so I was brought up with, I mean, it must so have happened. Birth uh, itself. Birth itself. Ha, ha, the, it was the blood of birth. They were terrified of blood and that the menstrual blood or the blood of childbirth uh, was really terrifying to men. And they actually, um, I think they called the vagina the dark place between feces and urine, something like that. Isn't that the most <laughs> dreadful thing? I can't remember the exact words. Well, they were also very afraid of just menstrual blood yeah. as well, so that everything connected with the woman was Anathema. Not sacred. But not sacred. And uh, something to really be avoided and, and be afraid of. And, and of. even Augustine, he had, he had an aunt and a niece who were both nuns, but he wouldn't let either of them near him, after he had. He wouldn't let either of them near him. This is but that, that's just what you're saying because yes. of this contamination yes. that might come from from woman. You know, anyway, that we could go on a lot a lot about this. Well, but it's it's a very important point because a lot of women are not really aware of the historical facts of how they have been devalued uh, and how their bodies have been devalued and every function of the feminine has been devalued mm. because in our time we're beginning to try to bring value back to the very source of life which would include a woman's body but it's, it's I think a very very important point and that of course is probably much of what led you to uh, the feminine and writing your book. Yes, writing the whole thing about the feminine I just want to say one more, more word there, because I think that what we're seeing now in the huge emphasis on sexuality and anything to do with sexuality 
is the reaction uh, to the repression, the 1,500-year-long mm -hmm. repression of sexuality. Mm -hmm. But it's gone too much the other way now, and yes. we're possessed by um, the fascination with sexuality, if you like, because the body still is not valued. No. For all the talk about the body and no. the care of the body, it absolutely is not valued. If it was, we would not be able to go to war and uh, kill the young men and women who are dying now. Yeah. And uh, children. And children. I and mean, we yes. would not create these armies of the orphaned and the destitute oh, no. through these dreadful wars. So th the body is not sacred. And until no. that becomes taught in, you know, in the earliest years of childhood, uh, I don't think that our culture will really change. And we won't really be able to understand the feminine, I mean, the body as sacred and sexuality as sacred until we begin to get in touch with the historical un absolutely uh, uh, and the valuing and the loss and of how that. it happened we, we have to know the historical sequence of events that led to this idea this belief really and I've tried to cover it in two chapters I mean it really needs a book in each but I've referred people in those chapters to other books which can cover it mm -hmm. But one, the first chapter is on the whole doctrine of original sin and the myth of the mm -hmm. fall. Mm -hmm. The idea that there was a sin at the beginning, that there was a fall of man at the beginning uh, in which we became separated from paradise. And secondly, the effect on women, misogyny in the church mm -hmm. which, and in the whole culture which developed mm -hmm. from these, uh, the actual myth of the fall itself and the mm -hmm. fact that Eve was blamed for bringing sin, suffering and death into the mm -hmm. world. Can you imagine the burden on woman carrying the legacy of Eve mm -hmm. for nearly 2,000 years? And we have carried it without knowing and without sometimes. Knowing it. Yes, because yes. this is not taught in any school or university. Mm -hmm. Unless women ferret it out for themselves, mm -hmm. they're not going to discover it. And it's had such a profound effect on the lives of women and how they live uh, their lives because if we're not confident if we don't have a sense of our value and we don't realize what has been projected on us then we think that there's something personally wrong with us and it makes it very difficult for us to create in the world and with our full capacity in an authentic way in an authentic way yes it does mm -hmm. because that otherwise the danger is that we copy the male ethos and the male manner of behavior because that has been thought of as the male was thought of as superior to the female or you know, as it were created first with woman second this comes into Islam comes into Judaism comes into Christianity even I'm um, ashamed to say in the in, Eastern, in the Eastern world as well, as well yes. so they're not exempt from this no. so the belief that that woman is a secondary and inferior creation mm -hmm. is deeply deeply in the male psyche and the woman's psyche as mm -hmm. well oh yes we certainly have carried it and that's it was taught in churches and uh, synagogues and uh, mosques for century after century after century and uh, th there's a huge work of really, as I think you were saying earlier, clearing out the boulders mm -hmm. that are blocking up the stream of life and the stream of the feminine consciousness, particularly. Because if the feminine, if woman isn't really in touch with her authentic being, she can't give the quality of that being to her children, either her, her sons or her daughters. That's right. And it's equally important for the sons as for the daughters. Oh, absolutely. And unless they grow up with this respect for woman and for woman's um, role in life, which is to nurture and protect life, um, as we see in so many instances, a woman will do anything to save her children's lives if she possibly can. Yes, and I think it's so difficult today because we're, as women, and I think as men too, we're unaware that the very way we structure our society and structure our getting together and structure the way we share information and is, education, and education mm. is structured by the dominance of these attitudes uh, which have been called the masculine controlling attitudes yeah. not the full beautiful real potential of masculinity but that the projection of this pollution onto yeah. women has caused society to be so structured that we can only function in a way that is um, one-eyed, really. One-eyed, that's a good way yeah. to put it. So that women who today are going into various professions and going into the universities, we are structuring ourselves to try to succeed in the structures that are not always natural yes, to... Yes, not balanced. We no. adapt to an unbalanced That's right, that's a good way of putting culture. it. Mm -hmm. and, well, 
So I think that that really, um, what we've been talking about, is really of great importance for today, how to rebalance the culture. And this is what Jung's work was all about. This was what he was trying to do. Yes. And this is why I uh, came to write The Myth of the Goddess with Jules, because we wanted to give the whole history of the feminine archetype, what had happened to it, how it had got superseded by the um, male archetype in the form of God the Father, mm -hmm. and how everything to do with that er earlier culture had been repressed and lost, yeah. or distorted, or fragmented. Mm -hmm. And we've only really got fragments of a tremendous tradition that which once existed and which mm -hmm. nourished whole communities, um, I would say, prior to 2000 BC. Mm -hmm.